Nine o'clock, I would like to call this Quebec County Highway Committee meeting Thursday, February 18th, 2021. Due to COVID-19, the meeting is conducted under Wapaka County Resolution number 8, 2020-2021 and Governor Evers Emergency Order number one. Please note the following information. This meeting will be broadcast for one access on a live stream on YouTube. This meeting may inadvertently cause a quorum of other county committees or the county board of supervisors, no business decisions of any other committee or board of supervisors will be conducted at this meeting. Participation in person is permitted. This meeting will be conducted using CDC and DHS guidance regarding social distancing. Tables and chairs will be arranged accordingly. Face coverings are required unless an exception applies. This meeting and all other meetings of this committee are open to the public. Proper notice has been posted and given to the media in accordance with the signs and statutes, so the citizenry may be aware of the time and place and agenda of this meeting. We have all presence members, two, two of the members are Zooming. I need a motion to uh, review and approve the agenda. Move to approve the agenda. I'll second it. Motion by Jim Nygaard, second by Dick Rowan. All in favor? Just, Aye. This, is, Aye. this is Casey. Agenda item number three. I don't think you have to add that. I think I can make the wording there. Okay. All right. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Good. Uh, review or minutes approval of the previous meeting, February 4th, 2021. Move to approve. I'll second them. Motion by Fred Zog, seconded by Lee Muck. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Um, public comment. Anything, Casey, you want to say? Uh, agenda item number two. We have Eric with us, so I don't believe we have any public comment. My only comment is that thank you, Lee, for doing all my work for a month and a half or whatever. Well, I get half your pay. That's I, well, I think it was written in the stipulation. Checks in the mail. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, I figure I, I figure I got the two shots. I did everything science could do, and I met the minimum days, so I'm back. <laughs> uh, I, we need to review and approve the payment vouchers. All right, we'll get started. We only have one payment batch registered to approve this time, and I'll touch on everything $1,000 or greater. Please ask if you've got something that pops up you might want to question. So the first one is Bureau of Correctional Enterprises. Um, we purchased various road signs chargeable to our stock account and our marketing and signing account, and that invoice was for $1,725.84. The next one is Compass Minerals of America. That invoice was for $3,617.26. Both of them were then charged back to the city of Wapaka for road salt. Drager Oil had a bill for $15,352.28 chargeable to our stock account for diesel fuel up at our Larrabee facility. Fastenal Company had one for $1,646.76 that gets split amongst all our various accounts. And then also a little bit went to Unit 404. Um, Hellron Lubricants had a bill for $1,300 charged to shop supplies. And then some of it was for Greece, which we just call it our UD account, undistributed. It gets split amongst all of the equipment because um, you're purchasing grease that goes in all the equipment. So it goes, um, we, we classify it as the UD account, right, Chris? So the uh, Lakeland Automotive had an invoice for $1,992.52. Um, again, split amongst all our various accounts from stock to shops to, um, um, shops to our equipment. E1178 and unit 1183. McMahon Associates is... Um, doing the oversight and uh, of our wetland mitigation banks. Previous one for their work performed in December for the O'Brien submittal and O'Brien site is $1,201. Monroe Truck Equipment out of Green Bay had an invoice for $272,558. That's for the capital acquisitions for unit 1180 and 1181. Um, 
The next one was from Monroe Truck Equipment out of Green Bay for $4,542.49. Um, for It got charged to unit 405 in our stock account. Um, tire service had an invoice for $2,377.58 for purchasing tires. Reister and Schnell had an invoice for $1,156.52 for filters, O-rings, and batteries chargeable to our stock account. Road equipment had a bill for $2,469.62 charged to our stock account, shop supplies, and then unit 919. Um, we did receive a core credit back. Russell Metals, Williams Buckhall had an invoice for $1,651.71, purchasing for various steel metal. That gets put into our shop supply account for now. Security Fence and Supply had an invoice for $9,000, I'm sorry, $6,925, chargeable to our buildings and grounds account. That was for the uh, Helvetia fence where we we're debating to put a fence up to keep the salt thieves away or to build a berm. And uh, we received two um, quotes. One was for 13,000 and the other one here is for 6,925. That fence is installed now. Sherwin Industries had an invoice for $1,023.54 chargeable to our stock account, unit 740, 741 and 742. Snow Depot had an invoice for $3,382 chargeable to units 1166 and 1138. Sugar Creek Farm sold us some property for County Highway N phase two to be built in 2022. Um, that was for $1,850. Syntex Systems had an invoice for $4,871 chargeable to our fuel handling account. Um, it was for our fuel master service contract split amongst our four different shops. The next, the next page here, um, and I, 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 sh I forgot to do the math, but if you get to the bottom, Sue, of page eight, where it says Wapaka Equipment Rental Center, that business was sold at the same point where we were sending that $917.50 check. So that got voided. And then if you... Um, so what we need to do is we need to deduct $917.50 from this payment batch register and then calculate what that is, if you could help me with that. We have to reissue that. And we're going to reissue the check. To a new company. To the new company once we get their W-9 information back on their employee tax information, all of that. So um, <clears throat> moving on to the lower Wisconsin Energies had an invoice for $2,100.06, chargeable to our state routine maintenance account, our marking and signing account, and our buildings and grounds account. Um, and then the last one I've got exceeding $1,000 is Wisconsin Kenworth, and that is for $3,315.09, chargeable to a stock account, and then unit 1138, 1133, 36, 57. So, Sue, if you got that final number for the payment batch register for me. That's what we're looking to approve this morning. $348,700.06. I need a motion to approve $348,700.06. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. Motion by Fred Zog, second by Lee Muck. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. That rental place, I've rented a lot of stuff there. I've been impressed with that guy. I'm going to feel bad when he's gone. Yeah, Mark did a good job. So yeah. Agenda item number two, we've got Eric here with us from Westbrook Engineering. He has to be part of our meeting today and introduce himself and his company. Thank you. Up there. Got some kind of an overview of Thanks. So, um, this is kind of an overview of our company, um, some of the services that we offer. Um, there's some references on the back. 
things like that. This is just kind of a general uh, marketing packet um, that we hand out. Um, so again, my name is Eric Massey-Archon. I work for Westbrook Associated Engineers. Um, our main office is in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Um, that's where the majority of our staff are located. Um, we offer a, a range of services, mostly in the structural area. We started out as a subsidiary subsidiary of uh, Edward Kramer and Sons. Um, so we do a lot of the structural work. We did all of their um, shop drawings, all those kind of things for them. So our heavy end of the bridge design, um, structure work, um, structural investigation, those kinds of things. Um, we broke away from Edward Kramer Sons in the mid 80s, so we're completely independent now. Um, and we've done work um, in every um, WISDA region in the state, um, most counties um, we've worked in. There's a few we haven't gotten into yet. Um, and and they are, they're we're looking to expand a little more, have more local um, presence in some areas of the state. So I came on in 2018. Um, I had worked for a few um, other companies previous to that. I have about 20 years of uh, experience. Um, and so I came on to Westbrook in 2018. Um, we opened an, Apple, an Appleton office um, so that we can focus a little more locally on the Northeast, North Central um, areas of Wisconsin. So um, we've, I have worked in Wapaka County before. I've done um, stock construction um, work in, in Wapaka County. I did the uh, Q Bridge over the Tomorrow River. Um, I did the um, Pearl Street Bridge in downtown New London. Um, I've done the little bridge in uh, King, um, Cleghorn Road, I think it is. Um, so I've been in this in this county um, for quite a few years. So those projects date back a little bit. Um, but um, we're looking to have more of a design um, presence in the, in the Northeast and North Central Wisconsin. Um, we were just selected for a uh, bridge design project in, a, in uh, out of Gamey County on uh, KK. Um, we did one a few years ago in uh, O'Connell County. Um, so we've worked in the North Central and Northeast a little bit. Um, we like to get into this area more and we'd like to work with uh, you guys in Wapaka County. Um, I live in Clintonville, um, so I'm, I'm local. I live in the county. <laughs> um, we have some other local staff that, are, that live in this area as well. Um, most of our design work, um, it comes out of that uh, Spring Green office. That's where our uh, structural engineers are. Um, so they do the work there. Um, we do a lot of the legwork here. We'll do a lot of the meetings um, locally, all the coordination. Um, I usually do the QA, QC, um, a lot of that work. So um, from this north, northeast, north central region, um, I do a lot of that QA, QC work on our plans. Um, so as you can see in here, some of the services we offer, like I said, um, we're, we're heavy on the structural side. That's um, how we started. Um, we have a lot of structural engineers. Um, so that's what we focus on. We do roadway work. Um, oftentimes it's associated with a structure design project, but um, we are able, we have that capability. We do that as well. Um, there are some of the other services we offer. We do all of our um, surveys in-house. We have RLSs and PLSs on staff. Um, they do all our plant work in-house. Um, we do a forensics engineering. Um, we're hired uh, nationwide. Some of our structural engineers do nationwide work on the structural design and forensic engineering side. So um, we do quite a bit um, out of state as well. On the second page, you see just a breakdown of some of the, the services we offer. Um, and, uh, quite a few different areas. Yeah, second on third page. And then on the back, I just um, attached some of the references if you were ever interested in county I think some of the individuals that we work with. I put mostly counties on there. We do a lot of municipal. Um, private work, um, city work as well, uh, but I kind of focused on some of the, the local um, or, you know, county um, contacts that we have. Uh, we do quite a bit in Outagamie County now. I do all their operation uh, inspections um, for them. We do some design work for them as well. Um, so those are just some of the references if you're interested. Um, one of our main selling points, um, we are small. We have about 25 employees. Um, every one of them is billable except our two HR staff. So um, that helps us to keep our overhead extremely low. Um, I think the state average on overhead is about 1.5%. Um, we're, we're right now at about 1.18. So we keep it under uh, 1.2. 
that allows us to do our work extremely efficiently, efficiently and we pass those um, efficiencies on to our clients. So um, generally you get um, a lot of experience and great quality um, product and a cost of the firm um, charge you. So, um, those are our main selling points. Do you have any questions for me? I guess um, in the near future, the uh, underwater dive inspections, is we're, it's in today's uh, uh, agenda items to get approval to do the underwater dives. That's something, are you an inspector yourself? I, I'm, a, I'm a team leader. Um, yep, I am not certified to do the underwater dives. Um, I, I do the, the routine um, inspections. Um, my boss, Aaron Palmer, um, he, do, he does the uh, fracture critical. He's also the pro, a program manager. Okay. Um, so right now he's a program manager in Kenosha, Marquette, um, Pepin, um, Green Lake. Um, he manages their programs as well. Um, we don't have anyone certified in-house right now that does the underwater dives. Um, if that's incorporated in one of our, one of our contracts, we usually sub that, sublet that out. Um, that is something we're, I guess, working on. I would like to get uh, certified. Um, I'm not currently, um, but in the future, um, okay. there's a possibility we would um, be able to offer that in-house, uh, but we don't currently. Thank you. Yeah. Can you just tell me how to pronounce your last name? <laughs> it's Massey Archon. It's almost you. phonetic, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for letting me come in. We did um, submit on the on the structure designs for County Truck Highway also our, our proposals in your little stack there. So, um, yeah, we appreciate you letting us come in and we hope to work with you guys in the near future. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for coming, Eric. Thank you. Okay, our next one on our agenda is permission to approve source well plow equipment. This is not out of this 2021 budget. This is for the 2022. So we're all aware of it. And uh, I need to, do you need to make any comments, Casey? Or? I guess um, back in November, maybe early December of last year, we had um, gotten per permissions to um, order the trucks out of our 22 budget, the cab and chassis. And what we're looking at doing here is getting permission to use the source well contract to purchase the plow equipment, the dump boxes, the liners, um, all of the stuff that goes on that chassis. So in 2022, both the Kenworth truck shows up along with whatever uh, quad axle plow equipment package we, we purchase. Um, if there's an opportunity for us to walk back here um, behind, behind the in the facility at some point, I'll just kind of show you what this package all includes. Um, if you wanted to do it in, in general, it includes the, the dump body, the tailgate, the floor and the understructure, the cab shield, um, the hoists, all the stuff that's not included on the cab and chassis purchase. That's what we're looking for. And so um, the front plow, the rear plow, the electronics that control the plow in the cab, um, the hydraulic assembly in between the cab and the dump box. So it, it, it's more, it's a lot. It, it, thank, thank you. I think he was very clear in our presentation at the county board how much money we do save by doing this. And the, the most important thing is when something breaks, our guys know how to put it back together. That's the exactly. best part. Exactly, right. That's the best part of it. You know, it's, otherwise they'd have to YouTube it to see how to do it. And what we're looking at is, um, for each one of these, you're looking at about $130,000 each. So this is about $260,000 worth of our 2022 equipment budget just to outfit these two trucks coming in 2022. Do I have a motion to approve it? I'll so move. Second. Second. Okay, I got a motion by Lee Muck, seconded by Fred Zog. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? One, one question, Casey. The, there's a the joystick in the cab that comes with a chassis, or is that part of the... the comes part of the equipment package in the plow equipment package. It's part of this. It don't come with the truck. Okay. No, all that comes with the truck is shifting it, reverse neutral drive. All right. Okay. So we're all set. Motion carried. Moving forward, uh, permission to bid. Um, 
asphaltic <laughs> mixture materials and surface treatments and bituminous paving mixed material. Do you need a, a separate motion for each one or just one for the whole thing? I just need a permission to bid this uh, equipment out, or not equipment, but materials. This is our hot mix yeah. asphalt. We did not include it on the initial one just because we were hearing from our suppliers that it wasn't quite time to uh, to bid it out to get the best bang for the buck. Um, and the oil's going up. Now, now oil's yep. going up. <laughs> Do I have a motion? I so move. Second it. Motion by Jim Nygaard and second by Dick Brown. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Review and discuss 2021 fringe benefit rate. All right, so I've got um, some reports to to review with uh, with the committee. Chris is going to help me out with these, and so um, I'm going to I'm just going to pass it over to Chris right away to be um, my master at explaining these next several agenda items. So the fringe benefit rate is um, what we charge all of our customers to recover the cost of benefits for our employees like vacation and sick pay and safety shoes and social security and all those kinds of things that um, it, we pay to have an employee or it costs us to have an employee. So to figure that out, this is a uh, spreadsheet that the DOT has developed and is used by all of the counties throughout the state. Um, you gather all of the labor that is reported, which up on the top there is $4,304,000 for 2020. Then you take out the time off with pay like the vacation in sick because we're, that's what we're recovering. So we take that off of there. So the labor that's subject to fringes is $3,690,000. 3, that is just labor only. That's what the guys are doing out in the field, the office staff working in the office, Casey's time just here at work. And then over on the left-hand side of the page is where everything is broken out. So there's the sick leave. I separated out emergency paid sick leave. That was the COVID leave for our employees that needed to quarantine or um, were off sick due to, due to having the COVID or being exposed to it. Um, and then there's a sick leave lump sum that's payouts for retired people. Um, then there's vacation, the holiday, it's all broken out there. So <clears throat> excuse me, the total fringes is 2,273,000. And the bottom portion of the spreadsheet, there's a variance computation. We take into effect things that maybe we didn't cover enough last year or we over-recovered. The calculation all goes into this year's calculation so that we're trying to be as accurate as possible, but you know, there's a lot of unforeseen that you can't predict. So that variance then carries forward. And over on the right-hand side, it comes out to the calculation of the rate of 62.49%. Last year was 59.84%. Now that all looks good. I need to send it through the state for their approval, but just bringing it forward to you guys to so you know where we're at. Um, that amount will be charged on all of the invoices beginning February with February's invoice going through to next January. So, any questions on how that's all calculated or? We over or under recovered last year? Over recovered. Or I'm sorry, we under recovered sixty seven thousand, but we're still working over our over recovery from years past. So okay, all right, balances out. I thought I was, thought that's what I was reading. I think. Yep, no. under recovered sixty seven thousand, but we had a balance of over recovery of thirty six thousand. So we're still okay working off a little bit of a under recovery. Yeah, well, with the new building, the expenses are. This is just for employees. Employees, that's yeah. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. How is this going to look a couple of years out? It's been remaining pretty constant between about 60 to 65%, pretty constant. One year, I know it was 89%, but we had a lot of retire retirements that That's year. What affects it big time? It seems like, and health insurance. Okay. Oh. Two things you can't control. Right. <laughs> Now, can you recover the emergency sick leave uh, with the COVID or that's not in a factor in the... Uh, that would be reflected in next year's because we didn't get the money until 2021. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm, di I'm just wondering if there's some, some COVID money out there in some program, some way, shape, form or another. We get these emails on our county iPads 
and uh, that that 28,000 emergency paid sick leave just about covers this this uh, this thirty-one thousand dollar difference. And so, yeah, I don't, who who would we check into to find out if there is some. Uh, I did put the question out to Heidi on that, and we did recover some expenses. She had submitted a grant or whatever she needed to do for paperwork, and she responded back to me that it was booked as a transfer from the general fund. Um, she spoke with the auditors, and they figured that was the best place to put it. Um, let's see what else. Another instrument to be utilized to recover cash in your operations. Um, they figured that was the best place to put it unless our DOT accountants give us a different guidance, we'd have to reevaluate that approach. But that was where we're going right now that any recovery that we had for those wages went to the general fund. Okay. I was just wondering if there was some COVID funding somewhere out there that uh, we could tap into. Uh, and I, I, I don't know enough to know where to, to ask about how to find out <laughs> if there is, but... As of the first of the year, everything changed anyway. Do right. we run into much COVID right now? Or are people just not applying for it because they gotta, they've got to go to work and they don't want to give up their vacation and maybe working with it? You know, there's, there's a couple of ways to look at this whole circle. I'm not in the fog. I pay attention. <laughs> so I just I wonder if that's where that's at. And I can't say nothing negative or positive about it. Right up front, we were required to uh, um, keep track of all of our COVID-related stuff, even down to purchasing uh, materials and sanitizers and gloves and masks. And there was a lot involved. And correct me, Chris, but didn't you say there was about $54,000 worth of reimbursable stuff just for materials we purchased, which actually had nothing to do with labor? And I think that dollar amount was... I was only showing 10, so I'm not sure. I'm showing 10. Okay, I, I could be wrong. It's a different number. So we had about $10,000 worth of materials. No. Were all the materials and sanitizers and stuff like that reimbursed to us to cover those expenses, just not yeah. labor? Not of it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that was with guidance through Heidi and the auditors and whatnot. So that's yeah. how that one was calculated. If you want, I'll give East Central a call and just see if there's, it's an excuse for me to call them and uh, just kind of ask some questions and see if, it's just, I, I don't want them forgetting about us, well, Packet Are County out in the boondocks here. Yeah. It seems like there's lots of stuff for the bigger municipalities, but maybe there's, I'll, I'll give, I'll give East Central a call today sometime. Heidi was able to reach out and do a grant and she did recover some of those funds. 20,000, nice. approximately 20,000 came back to us. But like I said, it, that when I reached out to her where, how to account for that, that's where she said that it was booked as a transfer to the general fund. Sure. So that's where our 20,000 recovery or whatever went. One, one way or another, it'll come back. It's just, yeah, okay, nice. Anything else under this, Casey? No, I think we can move on to uh, agenda item number six. We haven't discussed 2021. We have to approve that rate or? It actually is approved through the state. Oh, okay. So All right. Okay. That, if there's a big change, I'll let you know. Yeah. Normally there isn't. It may change a tenth of a percent or yeah. after their review, but it usually is right off. Okay. If there's a change, I will bring it back. All right. So reviewing and discussing our small tools rate, Chris, I'm going to have you go through that worksheet as well. You're just as you've created it. So I'm going to have you explain it. Okay. Um, the top portion of that, the labor fringe benefits, shop overhead, fuel consumable tools and machinery rental. Those costs there are strictly costs of our employees working with small tools and purchasing of small tools. So that has a total cost of $71,000. We recoup that cost by charging the small tools rate on all of our field labor that we do. Um, and that last year we covered 63,000. So we have a variance of $7,000. So that field labor that I just mentioned is $3.7 million for 2020. That includes 
all work we do out in the field for towns, um, ourselves, the state, it does not include admin, buildings and grounds, those types of things, or squad repair. Um, so that using that calculation comes up to 1.875%. And down below, there's a variance of where we over or under recover from the years past. That's what that negative number is there. So the actual rate is 1.776%. The state always rounds that to be one tenth of a percent. So the rate for 2021, beginning in February, would be 1.8% charged to all invoices, all customers. Just out of curiosity, what's a consumable tool? A consumable tool would be like something that can't be recognized by the state. So our shovels, our pails, our rakes, um, survey uh, equipment, like the, the levels and string lines, uh, miscellaneous, just small stuff that the state doesn't say it's that much per hour or that much per day as a cost. It's just dispensable in a roundabout way. Um, and used on more than one job, so you don't just charge out the shovel to this job. It's yep. everywhere. So again, that is another another rate that needs to be approved by the state. Um, I don't see any changes, but if it does, we had one point eight seven, and they had, and they rounded off to one point eight. So does that mean we lose that? Well, we have that variance in there too. That point, that negative point nine, okay. point zero nine. Okay. So the actual rate is one point seven seven six. Okay. And then they'll round it to 1.8. And now, Chris, we submit that 1.8% to the state. Now, they collect it from the other 71 counties, and they come up with an average, or are they just independently approving ours? Independently approving. If Auna, yeah, so if Outagami was 1.4 and Shauna was 2.9. They charge their actual. They charge their actual. So, all right, this isn't taking an average. This is just a pack of counties. Correct. Okay. The admin rate is what you're thinking. And if we overcovered and under-recovered, they make it a variance adjustment for the following year and yep. fluctuates. So looking at the bottom of that last year, we over-recovered $10,000. This year, we over-recovered $3,000. Or I'm sorry, we under-recovered under-recovered under $7,000. So the difference is $3,000. That's what that variance is in there. So that affects our budget, just that $3,000 on small tools. Anything else? If you have questions, that should be it. Moving on, number seven, review and discuss Sheriff's Department overhead invoice. Okay, so <clears throat> I would have to say that the um, discussion isn't new right now. We've we've brought it up multiple times. The sheriff was in here with 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 Carl Arts and um, said that there was going to be an increase in the rate that we have to charge to recover the costs of having a bigger area for for servicing sheriff's department's vehicles. And so, Chris, if you wanna start with this one again, um, otherwise I can do it, it's up to you. Makes no difference. All right, let's go in, in looking at it. So it's, it's on your overhead screen. Um, the direct labor charged in 2020 was $3,993.16. Um, the cost in, Incident to labor at 59.1% was $2,359.96. So the total labor just in from January of 2020 mm -hmm. was $6,353.12. So that's, we're, we're looking back well over a year ago for what that rate was just in January because we update these rates in February when our new year Fringe. starts. So the first dollar amount is just for the first month of January. And then that second block where the direct labor charged in 2020 would be now basically February all the way through the end of December. That was $47,129. And then the cost incident to labor of 59.84% equal $28,202.50. So the remaining part of 2020 was $75,332.34. A lot of that has to do with um, maintaining the sheriff's department squads. That's primarily what we do, a lot of their vehicles and so forth. And so adding the rate in January, plus the rate February through um, 
the end of December, the total amount in 2020 came in at $81,685.45, utilizing the 2019 shop overhead rate of 94.1%. That gives us the amount due for all work performed from the Sheriff's Department um, of being $76,866.01 which is a significant increase due to us building a new highway facility on how other entities are gonna help cover the costs of having a shop to maintain sheriff's department squads. And so if you wanna reflect back and compare 2020 to 2019, um, overall combining them together in 2019 was $85,251.55, our rate our shop overhead rate was a lot lower. It was at 66.34%. And so um, that equaled an invoice last year at this time that we sent to the Sheriff's Department of $56,559.70. And so you're seeing about a $20,000 hike billed to the Sheriff's Department to help cover the costs of having a shop to maintain the uh, um, Sheriff's Department's equipment. We've talked about it multiple times. If we didn't have to report it in this fashion and we were a private entity, we would just recover this rate by calling it profit. We would charge more, but we have to show it in this fashion and give them a separate invoice. Um, otherwise we would have billed it out, what Chris, every month mm -hmm. as a, a squad became due and then they would have been done. But the way that we function, we tally up the shop overhead rates costs at the end of the year, and then we give them a final bill at the end. And so um, it's went up about $20,000. Which we did. What does this all include? I guess is my question. I'm assuming, I know they got to have summer tires and winter tires and that stuff, but does this include running it through our car wash, washing the inside of squat? Has any, has, has it ever been looked at in the last 25 years, what we do to vehicles? Because maybe there's some way we can cut this down somewhat. You know, are, are we washing windows inside and out on squads and that kind of stuff too? Or what, what's going on there? I believe that we are much... Do you know what's going on when they, when a vehicle comes here or not? Or Well, it, it's just the labor factor. It's only the labor, right? right. Well, that's why I'm so, asking. Uh, what all is in that labor is what I'm asking. I understand you change tires and stuff, but... Are we doing incidental things that we don't have to do in labor? I guess is my question. I'm sure there's preventive maintenance and things like that that we track and take care of. And they do, the Sheriff's Department does get individualized bills per squad of what we do to them. And we also keep a record here of what those, what that work entails. We, um, how many squads are there that you do work on? I believe I had heard at one point that they have 55 in their fleet. 55. About 55 in their fleet. We have about 20 of them parked outside our shop at any given time. And then the rest of them are deployable to the sergeants or the patrolmen out in the field. And so they have about, and I'm not speaking that I know hundred percent about sheriff's department stuff, but I heard about 55 squads at one point. That came through does, the does anybody know how many miles they roll up during the course of 12 months on the average? Uh, I don't know if I've got a cut. <laughs> I, I know we I think I did not keep it in my booklet. The reason I ask this question is, you know, we have a, a truck wash, car wash. I'm assuming do their squads go through our car wash now or before they probably had to be hand washed and all that kind of stuff. You know, I'm just wondering if we've ever looked at what's getting really done on these things anymore. Maybe we can save them some money. Well, are we, the, the issue here, are we saving money or are we just taking it from one hand and putting it in the other? As a, I mean, as a county, we're putting it, we are, we are the company of Wapaka County. In that company, sheriff and highway, one of us has to cover these costs. And so we'd charge it based on direct labor to the sheriff's department. Yeah. If we don't charge them for it, the highway department's paying for it. And if we're paying for it, we're going to say, get rid of Kent Harrington, get rid of hit 55 squad cars to maintain, because I don't need that mess in our shop. I don't need all them tires. I don't need the headaches of dealing with the sheriff's department's stuff if they choose not to pay for their services. And so 
there's two ways of looking at it. I could get rid of a, an employee, but then the sheriff's department is going to have to farm all of their sensitive item stuff out to a private company, which they don't want to do a lot of. Um, I just well, that would alive. I mean, that would eat the county alive. You know. Well, I, I, to me, this is just the, you're just putting the expense from the sheriff's department, or I should say, I think you're getting money from the sheriff's department to cover our costs. So if we didn't do that, we put them into the private enterprise, we're gonna send $76,000 to all the local municipalities or our, our private businesses. It, we're, we're, well, yeah. It'd be higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it, it looks like an expensive bill, but I think it's beneficial to the county because they're, they, they're probably doing a much nicer job in our shop than they would get in a private enterprise. Plus, all that equipment in those uh, squad cars nowadays is very, very expensive. All the computers and all that stuff, if somebody starts... You can't let people in those squad cars. Well, that's... that. Them. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I know it's, it's, it sounds like a big money dollar that we're... I don't know if we wait for your... If people think we're wasting it or making it, I, I, I don't know what people's opinions are, but this is one of those uh, uh, in and out items that you're putting it out of this pocket to this pocket, so it don't make much difference. It's just part of the expenses of uh, how we operate. But that's that's my opinion. If you were to take those vehicles out to private places, you'd have to clean them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I think as long as the sheriff is understanding and we understand that it's just part of the, the operation, I don't think anybody, I know at first, you know, because when we send it, because I'm on that committee now, when we send it to him and all of a sudden, Pat Craig says, holy crap, you know, no, it's part of the operation. It's just a normal everyday thing that goes on and it's nobody's over expending money from one part to the other. I mean, this is, yeah, it's, that's the way I look at it. it. It's important to know that what we did as a highway department is affecting the sheriff's department to primarily get the same service that they were before. Yeah, yeah. But now they're utilizing our facilities a lot more than they were in the past with holding meetings to yeah. state troopers are meeting with the sheriff's department here. And it's, it's yeah. that's a good problem. Yeah, no, it's, so unless the sheriff is upset about it, which I don't know, we haven't brought it up to the. We talked to them in the fall. Well, last year, yeah. No, it was going to go up for this yeah. year, but um, there are different ways that I could bill it rather than just sending one invoice. But that's a discussion for another time. I don't. That's well. That's it. I, that's the only thing I was thinking. If we know it's going to be approximately that this year or every year, bill it per month. You know, then it don't look. It don't look like we're making a big profit out of it or whatever. It's just right. no maintenance. Uh, that's something that we can discuss at yeah. another time, but yeah. yes, it's possible. Very good. I guess, I guess for me, uh, with the, with the complicated vehicles uh, right now, uh, I, I think it's good that we can do this in-house. Uh, there's There's been lawsuits against John Deere by farmer groups because uh, of right to service their own equipment. And so if we can service our own equipment, the cops don't have to clean out the car before it goes to a shop. It, there's, there's time savings to all of that stuff too. And then you've got to figure out where you're going to store that stuff when you take it out of the car. It's just all these things that are hard to put a price and a number on that are a convenience value by doing it in-house by the county, the highway department doing the service work for the sheriff's department. And I think they, if, if they need a little reminder about, well, okay, how much time is it going to take for you to clean the cars out and store your, everything that you've got in there in a secure place, because that's, that's a risk you can't have uh, if you drop the car off at, at the Ford dealer. So, yeah. I think we're all in agreement to go forward. I was glad to hear what Lee had to say. Well, thank you. Lee. You're on that committee. You know. Yeah. I'm glad that this isn't a uh, um, new topic because we brought the sheriff and Carl in here at the same time a year ago and so this is coming. And he says, as long as it keeps working for Heidi, let's keep doing it. 
Yep. I, I kind of like your idea about a one to one, to one mill rather than yearly. You, you could make an adjustment, a, a final adjustment. Right. At, at some point in time, but I mean, buy that by 12, uh, you know, and fill it accordingly and then. Approximate based on yeah, last year. Yeah. What it was one for, that's really a mess. Because the end of it'll, look, it'll, look, it'll look nicer on the, on the bills once a month than one great big one, I guess. It's, it's based on last year's top overhead rate. So as soon as I get the 2020 rate calculated, yeah. I could use that going forward. Yeah. Anything else before I move on? Okay, number eight, review and approve RFPs for County Trunk Highway OBOX culverts. All right. So the County Highway O box culverts are three, three structures located on Highway O that we want to do some hydraulic modeling, some flood data analysis, and basically size the correct structure, do some in-depth digging as to what's the right type of structure, concrete or metal, uh, maybe culvert pipes, whatever might be the best um, um, option for us. And so there's a lot of process engineering analysis that needs to go involved with each structure. We've experienced that in 2020 with Kyle and I trying to do the work ourselves and found that it needed to be, uh, it was beyond our level of expertise with the right computer modeling and permitting processes. So anyway, we bid them out. And so on your desk, you're gonna see um, three, four, eight different engineering firms, which are all on our uh, approved engineering list. Who, who apted to submit us some, um, some great proposals. And I thank them for taking their time because this, this was timely for each one of them to put a packet together for Wapaka County. But again, that's, that's the sales part of their business. And so um, I've ranked them based off of their uh, proposed fee. And then I just picked out of the, each proposal, the land acquisition per parcel dollar amount um, we're not quite sure if we're going to need a, to acquire a whole lot of property. I think one of them might need to be a, a stream rerouted, but that's to, to be determined based off of the design of the structure. So anyway, Westwood Engineering, um, their proposed fee was low. Um, you said Westwood, you meant Westbrook, right? Westwood. Oh, so that's up, up on, the, on, the, like on the screen. Like on the Casey, screen. do these fees include survey work and... Uh, writing new deeds and all that stuff too? Correct, we are not gonna be doing the topography survey and this would be done by this engineering firm themselves. Okay, and then they, they record the new descriptions and... If land is acquired, I don't think we're gonna actually acquire any land. I'm gonna to try to acquire property um, through a temporary limited easement or a sure. permanent limited easement where the landowner will still own the land. There you go. These firms are going to help us with that process, which has to be done through the real estate statute process. Sure. Um, reason being, I don't want to acquire the land around these box culverts is because the Highway O, we're not buying any land. And I don't want Wapaka County to own just a little section of, you know, uh, a quarter acre, a tenth acre um, in the middle of nowhere. I'd rather it be a PLE or a TLE that we can maintain through time, but we actually don't buy the land. So That's good, right. Highway O is not anticipated to purchase any right away. So the first one is Westwood, formerly known as Omni. Um, the next one is from Core Engineering. And then you're gonna see everyone else is pretty much ballpark the same with Grammer, Robert E. Lee, Westbrook, McMahon, all in that 60,000 or low 50 to mid 60,000. And then AECOM is higher 68,000. And then CBS squared's proposal was for $74,250. And so wow. every one of them can perform the work. It's just a matter of, do they have the time to do it or not? We're looking at getting the, the, the work that they perform for us completed by July 15th, which includes the survey work, the hydraulic analysis, the DNR um, permitting process. They'll have to go through Candace at the flood or, uh, zoning department to get permits. There's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done, not only for one structure, but for three. And so I budgeted $10,000 per structure for this project, which would be $30,000 total. Um, Westwood fell within it, core was ballpark. Um, my recommendation for the committee is to 
um, go with Westwood with the, um, offering it to them. Why do why is there such a difference? You know, when you look at when I look at that, is that the other companies have so much work they don't need the work? Is that it? Part of it's that I've also I submitted it to ten. We received two back. Strand Associates and Ayers said they're just too busy to even get the work done. I said then okay because I you know I got some friends in business. They always said we got a lot of work. We bid stuff high, and if we get it, it's a home run. And if we don't, we don't care. Same with us. Yep. Yep. So I need a motion to approve Westwood. For proposed fee at twenty five thousand six hundred acquisition parcel land deal fifteen hundred. So move. I'll second it. Motion by Jim Nygaard, second by Lee Muck. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Okay. Review and approve to send out our RFPs for space needs study for Larrabee Shop. Right, this one I had moved back a couple weeks just because I wasn't I didn't have time to make adjustments for it. Um, and there is one more thing that uh, Sue and I are working on together with Renee, who has provided us some some really good information on on building RFPs. And that is in this packet that we've completed so far, having a, a simple sheet or something that each firm can return back to us that gives us their firm price. It gives us um, references, and then um, the other one was what to so, um, price fee references and a bitter contact. A, a, a bitter contact. Who to contact? So there's a few missing items that we've been working on that we need to attach to this RFP. I think most importantly, we understand what the project's for, and now here is kind of the timeline that I'm shooting for. Um, next week, Monday, be February 22nd, we're going to issue these requests for proposals out to the respective architectural firms for a space needs study, um, followed by an uh, on-site meeting at the Larrabee shop March 10th at 1 o'clock. That's where they need to pre-register to see if they... They need, to, they need to email me and say, hey, I'm coming. That way I have a count of how many of these interested firms might want to know more about the facility. That's when we give our tour. And then if they have any questions, they need to email myself the questions by March 15th. I have to respond back to their questions by March 23rd. Um, then their proposals are due by March 30th. And then at the April 1st Highway Committee Award, I'll have um, open them up and we'll review it here at highway. And then we'll decide, is it something we even want to do based off of the prices we got back or are we going to move forward with this space needs study? And then we would notify it, you know, the winner or I guess, you know, loser, if that's how you want to word it by April 6th. And then we move forward with our phase one space needs study, which conducts an analysis of the Marion wayside idea Refabricating or re, re, um, I guess flipping if that's the right word, the the existing Larrabee facility, and it gives us a good idea where we sit as far as what we even need. Um, what we even need is the scope of the project. We've reviewed this, I think, three or four highway committees ago. Um, looking at an assessment and recommendations, evaluating the Larrabee shop. We're doing into recommendations of moving it potentially to the Marion Wayside. Um, additional services that we want them to provide for us is participate in meetings. They would come and give their um, um, presentation to us if they felt it was necessary. Um, it's everything we did with the, if you, if you were on the special building committee, I don't know if anyone here was for this facility. It, it, it's a lot less than that because we're not going to move forward building this facility and start designing this facility by the snap of our fingers. This is a project we're hoping to do in 2030. What we're looking at doing now is just to figure out if the Marion Way site is the right site for us. And if it isn't, what size do we need? Um, it might be sizable to the Helvetia shop. It might be sizable to Shawano County's West facility, which are all um, great facilities. They house the equipment, um, but it, it, it's trying to satisfy a plan 
because our Larrabee shop's water is not keeping up with washing our trucks. The septic tanks are not keeping up with holding um, our, our, our wastewater. Um, we are lacking internet, high pressure watered sewers. The trucks that we are purchasing right now are larger than all the single axles. We want to use these trucks year round versus not using these single axles um, or parking them all summer long. And so we're looking for more space. Our Larrabee shop right now has a approximate $330,000 roof repair coming due. Um, do we want to tackle that or can we just band-aid it until 2030? And so helping us making decisions um, for an upgrade in 2030, which has to be done at some point. So that's the request for proposals. I did mention this on Dick Keffin's radio show yesterday that this was, was an, uh, you know, a preliminary planning to set us up like the previous commissioner and committee did for us moving into this facility. They did that 10 years in advance. So it really helped. I need approval to send it out. I need a motion. I'll so move. I think it's a good idea. I have a second. Second. Motion by Lee Muck, second by Fred Zog. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, motion carries. Casey, I agree with you. You know, we're going to have to do something, and I'm not ready to spend that kind of money on a rough. I don't know how you feel. I just no. band aid and well, cross that bridge later on. Whether it's a house or it's a hunting cabin or you're hunting blind, you have to upkeep it. And there haven't been much upkeeps in this 1960s era facility. And there, there's time that we start at least looking at that. So, yeah. It's, 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 it's needed. Dick, that's your old home base. What's your response? Yeah, there, there hasn't much done there for quite a while, but another thing you got to remember is that the London shop was only built about two years after that. So that's going to be coming up too. I don't know what kind of problems they have with their roofing, but it's going to be a problem as well. No complaints on the roofing and they're on city sewer and water, which is huge. This uh, Larrabee shop is not, and you're seeing those underground systems starting to fail. So yeah. that's a big difference. That's a yeah. big deal. You're, yeah. yeah. You're right. No question about it. Thanks, Dick. <laughs> Let's move forward. <laughs> All right. Agenda item number 10 is to review and approve to send out requests for proposals for underwater dive inspections. So an underwater dive inspection is nothing more than um, a diver inspecting the bridge underwater. Um, it might be an abutment, it might be the columns, it might be some piers. Um, it's required that we do our underwater dive inspections um, through the, the HSI, which is the federal agency pushing for inspections to be completed. Our department is not capable or licensed to do underwater dive inspections. And so in 2016, our highway department, I guess, joined up with Shano County and Outagamie County to do a joint RFP. And um, um, two of our dives, I should say, we did that in 2017. So I reached back out to them and said, hey, can we get on your... Um, RFPs for underwater dive inspections and try to get one big project together with multiple counties. And then I found out that two bridges in Wapaka County are due um, this coming year. So that doesn't help us waiting for 2022. So because Wapaka County has two bridges that are due for underwater inspections in 2021, and we have four of them that are due in 2022 to stay on that same cycle with Shano and Wapaka. What I want to do is take those four out of 2022 and group them with 2021's underwater dives inspections that are due this year. And Wapaka County sends out their own request for proposals for six underwater dives this year so that we can start getting in the rotation where all of our bridges are, are done in the same year versus multiple years. Um, I reached out to Dean. He highly commends me for trying to get all of our inspections together doesn't see no reason why we would go a different route. So that is, um, you're, you're looking at about $1,500 per structure to get inspected. It comes out of our bridge maintenance program because it exceeds the $3,000 that I'm permissible. I need to get your permission to send this out. So um, we're looking at probably when it's all said and done, 
um, six structures, say it's $2,000 a piece, something in that, that ballpark of a $12,000 project that has to be done per the feds um, to, to keep them bridges inspected at least every five years. One question, how, how expensive is it to get someone in our area trained to do that, to become able to underwater inspect? I mean, they're inspecting everything above, or is that crazy to think that way? In our area, meaning our employee. All right, we have bridge inspectors. Or have you ever, can you check into that, I guess the best thing, don't, and, and if that's not, and maybe our guys aren't interested either. You know, I would say that we are interested, but to purchase the scuba gear and the tethers and all of the gear to do it once every five years is probably not worth it. Not worth it and there's opinion. also the component of um, insurance, the liability insurance covering somebody to do the work and then the, the professional liability exper experience in terms of the person actually doing it correctly, uh, protecting the county. So that that's that, in my opinion, that's co cost prohibitive. Thank you, Diane. The, yep. sheriff, the sheriff's department is checking on a dive team situation, but we've not progressed in any direction. But I don't know if those divers would be qualified to go look at a, a bridge underneath the, the water anyway. So uh, you, I would assume you have to have somebody with some degree in, in, the, in the industry to... Uh, Our above, above water inspectors are sent through a two week course offered by the Wisconsin DOT yeah. to understand the functionalities of a structure and what to look for when they do get underground, underwater yeah. or above, above water. Yeah. But when you're in these high, high flowing waters. You answered my question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we need so a, I, I need approval for Casey to pursue I, getting them all done this year in 2021. I'll make that a motion. Okay. Motion by Jim Nygaard, second by Fred Zog. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So just, I guess I didn't touch it. It's on the screen right here. This is an example of what Outagami will send out uh, for their underwater dives. This is what we had in 2017. So basically it's just a basic, it says we're Wapaka County, we need underwater dives. We'll reach out to underwater dive um, companies and then they can submit their proposal and then they can get it done for us. So if you did four of this from next year to this year with the two, what does that look out like three more years out? How many more bridges are coming? None. No underwater dives. So then we've got it all together one time. We've taken the two this year and the four that are due next year, combined it, and they're going to all be on a five-year rotation from here on out. Okay, and then at that point, we can combine probably with Shano and Outagama County. Then we could if we so choose to, yep. Or and I, are we going to be one year off from them now because we went a year earlier? We'll be one year off with them. So I could reach out to these other counties and ask if they want to be on our RFP, but. Does, does the federal, would the Fed ever consider letting you go a year on these two to be with the four next year? I would highly doubt that. No. no. I would. I'm just, I'm, I'm just asking if there's any. Yeah. This has to happen other places too where they aren't all lined up yeah. five years at a time. Maybe it'll work with Washera County or Portage County too uh, to get on, on schedule with them. Uh, and I've, re I've reached out to uh, Shano and Autogamy and said, if you got any for this year or want to jump on, because you've got some scour criticals that they need to be done every other year, you're welcome to join us. And they didn't have any at this time. Okay. Okay. I think, I think with six of them, you'll have enough there to get a decent price. It'll be worth their time. Sure. We're all set then there. Yep. Number 11, review and approve posting of seasonal LTE positions. So all this is, is just getting approval to, um, to advertise for our seasonal employees. We've reached out, or Sue has reached out to the uh, previous employees that have worked here during the summer. Sue, how many did we get back? Three are going to be joining us. And so um, we're doing... We're doing uh, some small changes in that we're just not going to advertise for seasonal employees. We're going to get a little bit more specific. One of them is going to be a parts tool room uh, administration seasonal employee that helps Larry do inventory throughout the summer. Um, 
that way we find someone in particular versus getting someone that <coughs> that thinks they might be um, flagging traffic and then we put them in the parts room all summer. So we're gonna shop a little bit more specific for that position. And then another idea I've got is um, a GIS seasonal helper. It's um, something I've been working with Jason McKeefrey on at our GIS department. I wanna get someone in house that's um, going to help us for one year in particular, get us up to speed with getting a lot of paperwork that's floating around this highway department centralized in one uniform area. And that could that, that would include all of our culverts would be on a, a map. For, and this is all for highway department use only. This will not go out for the public to use. It's for us to have all of our culverts on the same inventory, the location of all of our snow fence, would be put on the same invent on this mapping system. All of our snowplow routes would be on the same mapping system. And then work that Kyle performs for us with our utility permits, our driveway access locations, our construction projects. So you could click on that road on this mapping system and it brings up all the blueprints and plans for that project that we have floating around in miscellaneous file cabinets. And it's gonna be a tool that we're need to create, but it takes more than just Kyle or more than just our GIS department, um, which is fully capable of doing it. It's just, this is a lot of just highway specific stuff that we wanna be able to own and control and try to build it. So when we look for this GIS seasonal helper, we're probably going to advertise at the UW Stevens Point GIS program and see if there's any one of those kids or uh, students that are interested in working with us for a summer that has a little bit more knowledge than I do and can can relate to Jason McKeefrey's knowledge with uh, how GIS stuff is updated and I'm trying to digitalize our highway department slowly by not just hiring a full project to be done. So. I think, Good. That's, I think that's a great idea. We got to start digitizing because yeah. our cabinets are, are just floating everywhere with lost data that we need sometimes at an instant notice. A, a group comes in and says, all right, from New London, hey, we, we're going to put up snow fence, new foreman, new supervisor, whatever it may be. Who knows where all this stuff goes? And so we've, we've already done a lot of data collection already that just needs to be imputed into the system but I need someone to sit down and do it. And so we'll utilize that workroom across from Mark Korth's area. That'll kind of be their office, but it's just a college kid helping us with, with work. I don't know if we'll end up doing it in 2022 or 2023. Um, I think I have permissions to get up to eight seasonal employees with our department. I don't think we're gonna need that many. We'll probably have uh, uh, five, four or five that are out in the field and we'll have one in the parts room and one doing this GIS and then Kyle will have his engineering student. So maybe up to seven, but in order to, for Sue to put it out, we asked for the committee to give approval to do this every year. Has anyone look, anybody looked at the seasonal employee labor rates for next year yet? Because I think this, jobs are gonna be, to fill, fill these positions is gonna be more difficult. Yeah, my worry, and that's why a lot's going to depend on what you're paying, you know, this seasonal rate. So last year we had our HR department do that, and we were in the ballpark okay. with outlying counties. What we're finding is some of these seasonal employees, other counties are 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 hiring truck drivers, people that have Class Bs to help them do a lot of trucking during the summer. I have plenty of truck drivers, and so them rates are anywhere from 15 up to $18 an hour. And I don't feel comfortable at this point. Well, I don't really don't have the not necessary. There's it's not necessary. So if I reached out to out of gaming and said, well, right, what are your seasonal employees or Shano? They may have some postings for 15 to $18 an hour, but that's more for like truck drivers. They're probably also looking for their laborers or their flaggers help too. Um, and them rates are comparable to where we're at right now. Mandy will look at this is what you're Lori, Lori helps us with that over at the HR department. With three coming back, we need them. They need a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve the uh, seasonal. I'll second it. Motion by Fred Zog, second by Lee Muck. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 
motion carries. Personal employees, um, resignations, retirements, recruitments. The only thing I've got is an update on personnel. We, um, we offered a position to a sign tech position. They respectfully declined uh, the offer due to um, cost, or not cost, um, compensation. The compensation. And so what we're going to do right now is go back to two sign tech interviewing. Remember when we interviewed like two times ago? Um, there were some candidates that were, you know, respectful. And so we're going to reach back out to one of those and see if, um, if they're still interested in the position before we go through the whole process of posting it again. So as an update, we've, we've posted twice for sign tech positions. We've interviewed twice. Both of them have declined. They all oh, declined now too. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's good. It, it, sir, can you ask those two people that declined, what was their main reason or did they tell you why they, they need to be able to pay their bills is what they've told us. And the, the money was the offer we're making them is not close. And maybe we're searching for too good of a candidates. These people that we've interviewed are phenomenally good at their existing employer. They could have slid into other positions. That's yes. you know, that outstanding. Yeah. No question about it. Yep. It, uh, and, and maybe, maybe you're going to have to stop and think that maybe your sign filling positions are going to be the steps to your next job. Sure. And maybe we're going to have to talk to Mandy and up the ante if that's what it takes. Uh, tell them a little bit about Joe's background. He was with Roloff for 20 years. I don't know if I can or I can't do that publicly. Can't do that. Okay. No. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, you want to go into your um, I have a commissioner report next, or do you want to take a five minute break? It's up to you guys. I'm good with keep plugging away if you are. Yeah. Anyone need a break? Okay. okay. Commissioner's report. Um, the important things that we've got going on tonight's the Wisconsin Towns Association meeting. So I'll be a present at that one after my kids youth wrestling. Um, I think what I'm going to talk about is just updating the towns and saying heads up. Be aware that spring weight limits are coming around the corner. You might want to start thinking about that if it hasn't crossed your mind yet. So How deep is the frost? Have you heard anything? Oh, boy. Our frost tubes out here are frozen about 36, 40 inches. So in the highways where they've been pounded down and there's been no um, sun shaded areas, I'll bet you they're four or five feet deep in the highways. I, I would think. It's been cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Highway committee meeting will be two weeks from here at nine o'clock again. Um, there's a local officials meeting taking place to discuss the Hortonville bypass. And that's not for the public. That's just for um, transportation, public entity leaders to, to attend. Um, March 4th will be our next highway committee meeting. HR, we're fortunate not to have any COVID related incidents or situations in the last knock on wood three, four months, I would say now we're going quite a, quite some time. Our traffic safety committee, I have no updates. As far as our shop operations, um, our crews are getting ready for the new paver to show up so we can do a, a, a scenario on what that looks like. We're ready to see our new paver. Um, we're also now rebuilding uh, new units 1180 and 1181. They're getting put together. That's our 2021 new trucks. Are, are here uh, being rebuilt. Um, yesterday or Tuesday, Mark Korth hosted the Northeast region's shop superintendents. So they were all here and just amazed at our facility and, and um, want to want, want, want they want, they all want our shop, obviously. <laughs> so that's kind of puffing the chest out a little bit, showing off what we've got. Um, field operations, our crews have been snow plowing, chasing, um, um, drifting, um, a lot of the packing that's occur been occurring, we've pretty much got that brined and scraped off now, so you shouldn't see a whole lot of pack on on, on many of our roads. Um, but as it's warming up, it's coming off pretty quick with the sun being as high as it is. Now, we talked a little bit, you know, Fred, Fred and I talked a little bit about trucks going by. There were a lot of snow packed on the roads over there when you and I talked about that too on W, right? Or yeah. So yeah, we had... Uh, um, Right, right in the city of New London, County Highway X that, that, that's leaving south out of, not X, W, w. w that's leaving out of uh, the city of New London. 
we've been getting, and this has been an ongoing complaint for some time. And so there's a, a gentleman out there that's more vocal than any, and he calls our highway facility and, and mentions that, why are there so many trucks going by their house? There's nothing to plow. Well, on the first pass going out in the morning, you can bet that if the county truck is gonna go by that road and it's packed on, the guys that are plowing that county route are gonna be having their blades down. The guy that's going down to plow the south half of Mukwa as he's in route is gonna to try to help scrape that snowpack off. And the guy that's going down to plow uh, the town of Caledonia is gonna to try to help that county route just because why drive by when the he's plow is up? He's going through anyway. So you got four guys going and then also you got the guy that plows on State Highway 96, who doesn't use that route all the time, but there's three county trucks deploying to their work. And as they're going by, the guy that's at home said he was laying in bed and he could hear all this racket at night. Why is all this snow plowing occurring? Well, that's trucks going out. That's our army going to deploy. And we maintain the center 24 feet of, of County Highway W through the city of New London. Well. Once them guys are out chasing drifts and sanding and whatnot, their trucks may become empty. And so they come back that through that house to get back to our shop. They might reload with sand as their materials working out and they're out on their routes. They're back at the shop, get more fuel, and then they go back again. So these people now are seeing six to eight trucks going by, you know, even more. And then in addition to that, you've got the city of New London who is scraping the parking lanes and stuff. So there's a whole nother truck going by the house. So the roads are gonna be worn out, but at the same point, I don't know how else to get to these routes without driving by people's houses to get to them. And so I don't think the public totally understands that 100%. Um, why is the blade down and there's no snow on the road? Seems like an asinine question to myself. My operator met with Fred, right, at his house. Um, we aren't responsible for doing the city's work. So I'm not going to speak for what they do or are not going to do with, with plowing their parking lanes open. I don't know. He was, he said a guy was calling, calling and complained to us about speeding. <laughs> yeah. And well, I, said, I haven't seen anybody speeding here. But. One of the tools that we have is to monitor the speeds of our trucks. And so I looked up, what is the speed of, Kevin Kayser that goes by and plows that route. The speed limit's 25 miles an hour. And every time Kevin goes by that residence, he's at 21, 22 miles an hour. So it doesn't make sense where this complaint is coming yeah, from. I, it just, it. I, I can, I can verify. Huh? I do you understand it. Yeah. So now you, Fred's got the ammunition. Yeah. Back to work. Thank you. We deploy past that residence with four trucks. The cities is five. And, and, and like when Fred and I talked, I just said, hey, I come home from White Lake a lot. The drifting out there is unbelievable. Those trucks had to be out Saturday and Sunday. I mean, there were spots I turned around because I couldn't come home on the, the town of Wapaka roads because of the drifting that was going on. And now since then, when we plowed that, they, the town of Wapaka has really cut the snow back so that if there is some drifting, it's gonna drop in the grass before it hits the road. It's interesting how the snow has been pushed back a number of places, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had the opportunity to ride with uh, one of the operators from uh, the Marion uh, Shell Station down to 22 and turn around, come back. And I, lo I was watching his speedometer off and on, and he's going 25 miles an hour. And I always thought they went a lot faster than that. And I was amazed, you know, and he said, going up to Marion Hill, he says, sometimes I'm wondering if I got enough power to get up there. And coming back, he's got the wing down and we're, there's guardrails on both sides. He's got the wing down. And he says, I hope we don't meet anybody coming up over the top of the hill oh. because he's got to get that wing out of the way because he's, oh, maybe six feet over the center line, you know, and I'm thinking, me too, I'm hoping too, you know. And it was a great experience. And I told Casey, I said, it was a great experience just to ride with him because all of a sudden you're going down 110 and here comes a semi. Okay, now he's a big guy. We're a big guy. Uh, okay. Don't hit that somewhat, please. I don't want to. But it, it was a, it was a great opportunity. He's got an underbody scraper on there. Sometimes I could hear it. Sometimes I couldn't. And he explained that 
that road is so rough. He says, I can't put it down all the time. So it was a really a learning experience for me, but I didn't hit nobody. <laughs> but uh, it, I thanked him. And, uh, and I, if you get a chance, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to go sit in there and with all, and I mean, it's a new one with all just the joysticks and it's fun. And then throw the rest in there where Lee was. You come over the Marion Hill, come into the south, there's an Amish place there, yeah. and there was a UPS truck unloading. Uh, no, it was a school bus the other day. Unloading stuff there, parked on the road. <laughs> and he, you know what I mean? I'm just saying, oh my goodness. And you know what the road's like there. Talk about a dangerous situation. Yeah. You, yeah I was you, coming to our highway meeting uh, a month ago and uh, come up over the top of the hill, and the school bus has got his flashing red lights on, and I'm going, you know, 55 coming up over the top of the hill. And all of a sudden, I got 100 yards to stop, and I did. I mean, no big deal, but uh, I was glad I was paying attention and, and, and not. My brother yeah. used to say when he drove milk truck, he said, you'd come over that hill, and there would be an Amish buggy with a horse pulling yeah. it. And what do you do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For maintaining the road under their tires as they're using them, it's yeah. balance. All right. Um, moving down into our administration and engineering, uh, Chris and Mark right now are working on our inventory and just, we've learned a lot of things through Wisconsin DOT um, that Doug who had came and give us a presentation. And so um, how we're booking inventory, how we're booking parts that are chargeable up front, or if they get put on inventory and then get uh, charged, um, um, finding um, errors. That's, that's a common thing when you're, you're dealing with multi-million dollars, you might be off here and there a little bit. So we are meeting our, our standards, but we can be, we're, our, our goal is to be perfect. And if we aren't perfect with what we do, well then how can we be perfect? And I think that's what we're questioning ourselves on right now is how good are we? Has anyone audited us or asked how good our reports are? We, we were doing it to ourselves now by having the DOT and then another office manager that works for the DOT now once was with Outagamie County. He's here with Doug and he's, he's well willing and ready to come give us a presentation at any time we want. Um, it's just a matter of when we want to do that. So maybe Joel, you, you and I will talk offline on, on scheduling him to come back, but he wants to, to brief us on our operations. We want to make sure Jim's back. We want to make sure Jim's back. Yeah. Mm. Um, our projects are plugging away. I'm not going to go too in depth because we've got a, a closed session to go into here, but um, we're lining up borrow pits and buying right away and doing all the things, getting ready for this coming summer on our project. So that concludes the highway commissioner's report. That moves us, Joe, to agenda item 14. I make a motion. We go in a closed session. Okay. To Wisconsin Statute 19.851E, deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public property, the investing of the public funds, or conducting other specified public business wherever competent, competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session to wit for the sale of Ivisha Helvisha shop property, approximately 1.346 acres. We need a second for that. Second. second by Fred Zogman. We need a roll call vote. Yes. Chair McClellan? Yes. Vice Chair Muck? Yes. Supervisor Nygaard? Yes. Supervisor Rowan? Yes. Supervisor Zog? Yes. So no. give me just a moment. We we do need to go off YouTube. Oh. We're going off YouTube and we're closing the door.